when we're looking at vocabulary and language and then STEM, which everyone thinks of as math skills. Can you tell me how this all fits in together in terms of learning and successes as kids enter school? Well, believe it or not, language is the single best predictor of how you're going to have readiness for school. And even when we look a little farther out, between first and third grade and third and fifth grade, it sort of follows the child all the way through elementary school and beyond. So having good language skills, having a good formal vocabulary turns out to be really important. Now most people think that that's just about reading because obviously if you're going to sound out the words they should refer to something when you get those letters to sound correspondences and if they don't then you're going to be in trouble because you're never going to be able to read to learn all you're going to be able to do is learn to read ah but it turns out that this vocabulary is not just important for reading it's also very important for stem skills and your language and vocabulary predict how strong you're going to be in some of your mathematical skills as well. How is that, Kathy? Well, we think that what it does is it helps children focus on just the right places. So, for example, if you have to know about the uh, middle of the pack or the middle of the box, then you have to focus on a particular place in what otherwise would be a continuum, right? Because math and number exists on a continuum, on a line. And when we tell you to zoom in spatially on that line and find the middle, the beginning, or the end, you're using language to help pinpoint. What language is really, really good at is removing ambiguity and getting you to attend and to focus to just the right places. These are specific words. That, that kids need to, to learn and learn how to work well, I with? I would say more types of words. And those words are what we call relational terms. So let's just look at some of the spatial terms like through. I mean, what does through mean? To go through a tunnel, to go through a hole, or to go through a doorway? Well, it means that you have to move from the outside, right, under an enclosed space, and then to the inside and maybe then to the outside yet again, through. What does it mean to be on top of? You can't do on top of unless you have a reference point and then you have something that is positioned on top of or below or around. Those terms, which you can see by the way, I'm also using gesture to show you and gesture is another way of signaling good language stuff to come. These pieces of the language system or the communication system help us zoom in on that relation. That relation between one element and some positioned other element in the world. And those relations turn out to be absolutely critical for higher order thought. Let's just take a couple of examples. In math, even when I'm counting, I'm doing relational knowledge. I mean, two is bigger than one, and three is bigger than two, and four is bigger than three. And it goes on the spatial continuum. And remember, that doesn't just happen with whole numbers. It also happens with half, and a quarter, and three quarters, and five eighths. So even fractions are showing you this relation to the whole. So these relational terms, which are often coded in prepositions and in verbs in our language, turn out to control things like math. They turn out to control logic, right? Spatial reasoning, scientific reasoning. The red ball is heavier than the blue ball. And the green ball is heavier than the red ball. What's the relationship between the green ball and the blue ball? What's the best way to teach young children these relational words and these spatial concepts? Well, believe it or not, a lot of this occurs when you are playing spatial games. Now notice, I use two words that are really relevant there. One is playing and the other is spatial. So let's think about the stuff that incorporates play and spatial. Blocks. 
Blocks are absolutely perfect toys. There's nothing like construction toys. I mean, you can take the green block and put it on the red block or turn it at an angle. Look at all the stuff I just told you. Or rotate a puzzle piece so that that puzzle piece fits more squarely right into the place it's supposed to fit. Or as you find the shapes that are going to fit inside the border of your puzzle or paper airplanes where you're practicing folding, or origami where you're practicing folding and making new shapes out of old shapes, and even practicing the shapes themselves. Why would you believe that most of the triangles that you see in the world have shapes that have them angled all over the place, and yet when you look in a book and they label triangle, the only triangle you ever see is this beautiful isosceles triangle with a point on the top. So what's the kid supposed to learn? Has a point on the top means it must be a triangle or that a triangle has three sides and three angles. So when we're playing these games, whether it's with magnet blocks or whether it's with Lego blocks, putting things together, rotating them, moving them, we actually use more spatial terms than we do when we're just sitting at dinner or when we're reading a book or when we're doing some sort of art activity. What kind of interaction is important for parents to remember as they're playing these games? You know, the most important thing we can do as we play these games is to really be interactive. I mean, don't take out your phone and look at what text you just got, but really notice what your child is doing. And when you do, and you comment on it, something magical happens. Just by virtue of being there, our research shows that when parents are playing with blocks with their kids and when kids are doing those puzzles, children are using more of the types of vocabulary, these relational terms, that are going to help those kids later be better in math. And a former graduate student and now faculty member in psychology, Shannon Pruden, actually looked at this. And it turned out that those children who at age three had more of these spatial relational terms. Those are the very same children who were better prepared for mathematics at the doorstep of school when they were five. At what age should parents start? Oh gosh. Well, I can tell you that my granddaughter Ellie, who just turns two tomorrow, is already playing with Brio train sets and putting blocks together to build tall towers and she has some puzzles and she looks up at me and she goes, Wotate! And I say, Wotate. Rotate those pieces, fit it in. She's already learning relational terms. So never too early to at least start introducing. Doesn't seem like there's a too early to me. Now you don't want to get blocks that your child's going to put in the mouth and swallow. So you have to make sure they're big enough. Um, but no, it's really fun for kids. They love playing these games. And who knew that by playing these games, as we watch them play, we're offering them just the sort of nourishment that they need to grow up and have strong STEM skills. What's the implication of this study? Why, why is it so important? Why do we focus on those STEM skills, especially from an early age? Well, you know, the kids who start out stronger in STEM are going to be stronger in STEM the whole way through. That is, if you look at predictions of how you are in first grade, it looks pretty close to how you are in third grade and how you are in fifth grade and what's going to happen in middle school and all the way up. So why not give them a real head start? Um, secondly, what we have noticed is that, believe it or not, young children who don't have these experiences are at a real disadvantage. Just as we talk about the 30 million word gap, there's also the STEM gap. And we have been seeing the STEM gap by as early as three years of age. Three years of age. That means that those children who aren't playing with puzzles, who aren't building with blocks, those kids already are behind if they're, they're more middle income peers who have blocks all over the place. And blocks are simple. Blocks are cheap. 
if blocks can be something that can help us even more than all those apps that we download for $1.99, then why the heck not have a floor that's filled with blocks? If you could run through a list of um, the relational words that you would want parents to start thinking about ways to play with and show well, their kids. Well, I'm going to give you a bit of a laundry list, but I'm also going to suggest that the important thing is having the conversation. What's really not important is saying, oh, today is under day. Now, it's okay to do that when you're creating a wonderful show. <laughs> and you have under day and finding the kids can go under the table and the blocks that go under the piece of paper or the people who put something under the speaker. I mean, all that's great, but we don't need a list. What we need is a conversation. We need to kind of document what's going on in the children's world as they're seeing it. Like, look at that. I spy with my little eyes a triangle on top of the building. And maybe I'm just looking at the Empire State Building or the Chrysler Building in New York. We see rectangles and triangles and circles and spheres all over the place. And there are things that are under and over on top of and in and out and around and through wherever we look. So it's really just about narrating the environment we live in and helping our children notice. And as importantly, remember that what we aren't is just dispensers of information. The all-knowing gods who tell our children where to look at every moment. Our job is to notice what they notice and comment on it. And if we notice what they notice and we comment on it, we can enrich their vocabulary, have a heck of a lot more fun because we're really engaging as parents. And wouldn't you know, we're also preparing them for the world they're going to enter, which is formal school. Is there anything I didn't ask you, Kathy, that you think would be important for parents? Um, I think this conversation thing is really big. And I'll just add that conversations are a duet. You can't sing them alone. And when we tell our kids, look here, do this, must do that. Um, and I'm not saying you never need to do that. Like you do need to say, don't touch the stove. But when we're the ones who are constantly dispensing information or ignoring and closing down conversation, we're actually hurting our kids for the future. So I always say that learning is about singing a duet with your child. Your child has to be a part of that duet. You get to be a part of that duet. Together, have some fun. Look at the world around you and recognize that everything is part of your learning community. You just need to notice it. And when you do, you can enrich your child's world. When you play with blocks, parents naturally, naturally, naturally use these kind of relational terms. Isn't that amazing? So it's almost like blocks are the perfect prompt for the in, around, through, on top of, under, on, out, place, put, those kinds of things. So that's one really cool thing, that you can just up it. I think it's something like 10% of the language that you use are these relational spatial terms when you're playing with the right kind of stuff. So that's kind of a biggie. And we did a study on that. And you can see the leap from 3% to 10% of your language just by having the right prompts on the table. Children can follow kind of these spatial models. We've created a series of these spatial models. And sometimes it has two blocks and sometimes three and sometimes as many as six. And sometimes the blocks are just flat on top building a tower. And sometimes they're twisted and turned in ways that give you angles. And it turns out that kids can then do a progression of complexity. And by just looking at how they respond, and by looking at whether they can copy the designs, then voila, the ones who are better are going to turn out to have better skills. We created that, which is called, we call it the TOZA, the Test of Spatial Ability. And we are working with um, three to five-year-olds to just see how good are they at copying that design. And of course, that design then becomes that Lego castle or the Duplo Tower, 
about all the things that you want to build and uh, giving the prompts helps the language, helps the STEM. If you could walk me um, through the block study. 10, 15 years ago, um, we really thought that relevance could be part of science and we were one of the only ones who really wanted to take the information from the lab to the people. And, uh, and that's become much more popular. With that, we've, we have, I think, uh, nine grants right now. As I say, there's two, two different studies um, that I'll tell you about. In one study, what we did is we had these blocks that we got from Mega Blocks, in fact. And um, we had three different conditions in the blocks. One was we would just hand them to the kids and it was free play. Another was, here, this is already put together. Will you play with it? I think in this study, we had the it's already pre-assembled condition. And then we had the we're going to help you build a heliport okay, um, or a garage with the blocks. And the third is, here's exactly how you build the heliport and the blocks, right? So it's something along that line. So in the free play condition, the kids just sort of had this block structure and they're doing their thing. And in the guided play, we said, oh, we get to build a heliport. Would you like to help us build the heliport? Look, it looks like this. And the kids got to do something it's like building IKEA furniture. Okay, and we called that our guided play condition. And then in the third one, we just told them exactly what to do with it. All right, now what you can do is you can switch everyone, if that's the first thing that you do, you can switch everyone to a second condition where everyone is in the IKEA furniture condition, what we call guided play. The guided play condition prompts kids to go first, to have agency, to want to build it, to want to move forward. And when they do, Parents help by saying, well, maybe you can do that by putting the red one on top of the green one. Oh, that looks really good, Johnny. Would you like to move that around and have that in front of? All right, so then we moved everyone to the guided play condition in that second phase, and everybody's relational terms jumps up. Is that amazing? In guided play, children have agency. Children are the doers, and we are the coaches in the background, helping them make sure that that soccer ball gets into the goal on the other side. Mm -hmm. And when we do that, we help them learn. All right, let's move to study number two. In study number two, we have done some research with um, what we call the TOZA, the Test of Spatial Ability. And in the TOZA, we have six different designs. Some just have two bricks, some have three bricks, some have four bricks, some have six bricks. And we configure them so that sometimes they're turned around and at angles, sometimes they're just straight on, sometimes they're rotated around in weird ways. And we want to know something very simple. Can the children copy our design? Now sometimes we do it with 3D and that means we have the literal blocks that they manipulate in front of them. And sometimes we do it in 2D, and it's sort of like color form or felt. And you see our design, and you get to map it with the pieces that we give you. So in this particular study, we found that the children who were better at copying our designs, and who could go not just to the two design, but the three, the four, the five, and even get the rotation, that those kids turned out to be better in the pre-mathematics tests when they were five. So what they did at three mattered to how prepared they were going to be when they were five years of age on the doorstep of going into formal school. And what we'll show you is what it looks like as the children look at those designs and try to copy those designs. Now I don't know if it's ready yet, but if it is, we might also show you that you can do this both manually, and of course everybody today is selling digital apps. So we're going to be testing the very same TOZA in a digital app, and we're going to look to see whether at least with spatial relational terms, do you do better when you manipulate it, or do you do better when you just use in your fingers? Does it make a difference for spatial learning? That was for the first study where literally just playing with blocks and guided play, being the coach, not the director, you know, building that IKEA furniture together. So when you get your next IKEA couch, build it with your kids.
You have your PhD from? My PhD is from University of Pennsylvania. Master's was at? Uh, University of Pennsylvania. Undergrad was at University of Penn? Uh, no, undergrad was Pitt, University yeah. of Pittsburgh.